The world's highest court rules for the Rohingya. Myanmar's government is told to protect the Muslim minority from genocide, but will it enforce the court's orders? I'm Maria Ramos, and today's newsmaker is the Rohingya verdict. Gang rapes, beatings and murders. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fled Myanmar after surviving some of the most horrific abuses at the hands of the military more than two years ago. But finally, there's a glimmer of hope as the International Court of Justice has ruled that Myanmar's government must protect the Muslim minority from acts of genocide. And that was despite a robust defense from Aung San Suu Kyi. Once a human rights champion, the Nobel Peace Prize winner has seen her international reputation crumble after she defended the very military that locked her away for 15 years. Suu Kyi and her government reject the ruling and condemn human rights groups for painting a distorted picture. But as Haider Abbasi reports, the case could last for years. So will this initial ruling actually make any difference? They're often described as the most persecuted minority in the world. The Rohingya aren't wanted at home in Myanmar and struggle to be accepted anywhere else. But now their suffering has been recognized. The Republic of the Union of Myanmar shall, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, in relation to the members of the Rohingya group in its territory, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention. The UN's highest court says the Rohingya in Myanmar are at risk of genocide and must be protected. This means Myanmar's government must prevent more Rohingya from being killed and preserve any evidence of a genocide that might have already happened. It's the first time an international court has taken up a case concerning the Rohingya. It relates to a military crackdown in 2017. Thousands of mostly Rohingya Muslims were killed and around 700,000 fled to neighboring Bangladesh. Survivors said they witnessed indiscriminate killings, gang rapes and women and children burned to death. The case was brought to the International Court of Justice by the Gambia, which accuses Myanmar of committing an ongoing genocide against the Rohingya. Um, the fact that the decisions they have given today is unanimous. All 17 judges from the different parts of the world, representing different cultures and values, um, have all agreed that genocide um, cannot be tolerated by anyone in the world and that the Rohingya um, in Myanmar um, need protection as a recognized ethnic group in Myanmar. The court said Myanmar must report back in four months on how it's implementing the emergency orders. But there's a problem. Although the measures are legally binding, there's no way for the court to enforce them. Myanmar has always denied allegations of genocide. It sent Nobel Peace Laureate Aung San Suu Kyi to defend the government before the court in The Hague. In December, she asked it to drop the case. Suu Kyi said the allegations made by Rohingya refugees were exaggerated. Myanmar formed what it called an independent panel to investigate allegations of atrocities committed by its military. The findings of that commission said that although individual soldiers may have committed war crimes, it found no evidence of a genocide. The court in The Hague issued provisional orders to stop further killings, while it continues to hear the case against Myanmar. Those proceedings are expected to last for years. Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Joining me now in the studio is Mong Zarni. He's the coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition. 
Nyo Ingni is in Yangon and he was Aung San Suu Kyi's spokesman and founder, former member of Myanmar's ruling National League for Democracy. And in Dublin is Michael Becker. He's an expert in international law and a former lawyer at the International Court of Justice. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. Um, first to you, uh, Michael. Um, did the Gambia get what they wanted and is this a victory for the Rohingya? I think there's no question that this is a victory for the Rohingya and a victory for the Gambia. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Gambia got everything that it asked for. Certainly, these are uh, strong, uh, message, uh, strong measures that send a powerful message. As your intro piece uh, mentioned, it was a unanimous decision, which is uh, significant and not that common. Um, but the Gambia had asked for a few things that the court didn't do. Uh, the, they had asked for uh, not only an order telling Myanmar to live up to its obligations and prevent genocide from taking place, which of course is an obligation that Myanmar already has under the 1948 Genocide Convention, but they had asked the court to specify uh, particular types of conduct that might constitute genocide. The court ended up not uh, taking up their suggestion to do that and issued a more general uh, instruction to Myanmar, which may now lead to disputes about whether uh, Myanmar is in fact living up to those obligations. The other thing that uh, the Gambia asked for that they didn't get was an order that Myanmar allow UN investigators into the country to continue their fact-finding work there, since that fact-finding work has mainly taken place outside of Myanmar to date. Okay. Um, I want to go to Yangon and ask you, Nyomi, your reaction to the ruling. Not the official one. We have the uh, official uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, reaction here, but yours and in the country. I think uh, this is it's, it's quite a bit interesting the ruling, you know, the uh, of course, it's a, the favor to that the Gambia and then also the uh, we call the Bengalese, but the uh, it's a Rohingya. And then, you know, but that's one thing, the good thing is that the the Myanmar should and Myanmar could uh, uh, to prove that we have no intent to commit genocide. That's a very important opportunity to clear the name of that, the all allegations that we have right now facing. Okay, let's go to our studio. Zanni, your reaction. You were there in that very room when that decision was taken by 17 judges, including one, as you said, handpicked by Myanmar. Yes, my reaction. Um, well, in 1961, my great late uncle, was deputy commander in charge of the entire Rakhine state, which is the crime state today. And uh, you know, in, in his official capacity as a senior commander of a uh, Rakhine state, recognized officially in writing, uh, you know, reflecting the official Burmese government uh, recognition that Rohingyas are our own people, despite the, um, the different uh, faith that they express. And um, you know, they were full and equal citizens of our country. And, and today, or actually yesterday, when I heard the presiding judge telling the world, essentially, that Rohingyas qualify as a protected group under Genocide Convention. So I felt a sense of vindication, you know, something that my uh, great uncle as a senior military commander recognized was now officially repeated as a protected group, a part of the country, and having the right to exist as humans with all the rights pertaining to having that label, human beings. So I felt vindicated. There were other Rohingyas who felt uh, you know, deeply vindicated. But the thing is, we look at uh, the reaction, the official reaction from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it says there has been no genocide in the Rakhine, and they have their own commission. I can, yeah. You know what? What do you think you, of this? On, on, two, on bo three points. In 2012, Aung San Suu Kyi came to London, and I, she and I shared um, a panel at the London School of Economics alongside Milosevic, 
prosecutor, Sir Geoffrey Noyes, and Suu Kyi did not want to say a word about Rohingya. So I was pre-assigned to handle this question from the audience. So her position, the, you, you said foreign ministry or like Myanmar government, she's the de, de, de facto head of state. Her position eight years ago from studied silence over the subject today has deteriorated criminally. Now she is actually, she appears to qualify for a complicity in the crime of genocide, in the words of Sir Jeffrey Nice. And secondly, um, you said her independence commission, Aung San Suu Kyi's independence, it's a government-appointed commission with four commissioners, two from Japan and Philippines, and two from Myanmar. Not a single commissioner on Aung San Suu Kyi's commission who denies the existence of genocidal intent and policies can be considered qualified to, to pronounce anything on genocide, war okay. crimes, or crimes against humanity. Let's bring in Neon Mi. Uh, your uh, opinion about this independent commission inquiry and uh, what it can look into, can we trust it? Yeah, yeah of course, because, you know, the, as long as I, my understanding is that the... Uh, that independent ICOE, the uh, led by the 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 Filipina uh, who was an ambassador and also the Japanese ambassador as well. But you know the the how you you, you approach that the how interfere by the military or the government or local authority. There was none. They have a, you know freely question and freely. You see that right now. That's a five hundred thousand Rohingyas. Still live okay. in Okay, Zani is disagreeing with you. <laughs> no, inside the country, the, the, the commission claimed that 1,500 1500 people were interviewed. But every single international journalist that has been on Myanmar government arranged uh, tours of this uh, area and uh, interview people can tell you from BBC to CNN to Channel News Asia that these are hand-picked or intimidated, uh, frightful uh, Rohingya and Rakhine villagers who were primed by the government to say what they want to say. You've got 730,000 Rohingyas, most of whom witnessed various forms of crimes against humanity, uh, you know, okay. with their own eyes. And so, you know, it... it the, this is a government-appointed body okay. designed to whitewash the, the, the accusations of genocide. Okay. W what I want to Can do I now... Uh, yeah, far away. Yes, Michael. Yes, yeah, so on, on this International Commission of Inquiry that, that Myanmar set up, um, there, Zarni is correct that there are huge concerns about that commission being able to meet baseline requirements of independence, impartiality, and basic expertise to deal with the issues that they have a mandate to look at. But I want to point out that, yes, they have finalized their report this week, and they released a 15-page executive summary, but the full report hasn't been made available. And it's, it's not credible for the government to now point to that executive summary and say, this vindicates our position, when the report has not been made public and isn't subject to scrutiny. There's a lot of talk in the report summary criticizing other fact-finding efforts, the, the uh, comprehensive report that the uh, UN fact-finding mission created by the Human Rights Council put together and that the Gambia relies upon quite heavily. And there may be grounds for criticism, but the my, Myanmar's own commission hasn't done anything to show how it has lived up to the standards that it would impose on every other fact-finding body that has looked at the situation. All right. I want to ask now about the ICG's orders and are they, because they are legally binding, uh, binding what has been ruled, but uh, will Myanmar obey this? Uh, that question to you, Neong Mi. Yeah, of course. You know, that we are the, as long as we are uh, the member of the, uh, the United Nations, we, we must, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the follow that uh, what the court ruling, but at the same time we have a great opportunity to clear that 
the allegations and accusations and because you know of course there's going to be some like kind of local authorities or local the the military officers you know uh you know, the committed a crime and then you know some extrajudiciary killings but the point is that there was no intent to kill them. Hey, they they are the Muslim. That's why you have to kill all. Hey, no, I, mean, I think the I think you're missing the point here. Genocide but, is not simply about but, killing. Killing is only one of five but, acts. Killing. There are four yeah, other but, acts, uh, you know, which can be but, proven based on the policies but, of Myanmar that have put in place, uh, you know, the, since 1970s. The, and and you know that's the thing that uh, a lot of uh, the you know the merits of the, uh, the 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 case are very very strong and pointing to the eventual what I hope and what I think will be genocide ruling down the road four years five years however many years the fact is the ICJ has decided that the plausibility that at the end of the court proceedings in the final or middle phase, that it will find that Myanmar is guilty of genocide. Okay. Because let's, of that plausibility, it, it should provisional measures. Let's let, let's let uh, Naomi reply. Sorry. Yeah, because, you know, the, uh, the, the allegations, and we have to clear, because if you believe in the, the, the court of justice, so because we really need to have it Kind of sustainable peace, in in because you know because right now that's only a revenge. Like a Dr. Zadi mentioned, hey, they made a wrong. That my great grand uncle already made it. Or you know that's only an allegation, revenge, and then some kind of like kind of. Okay. Uh, this is making a more not a solution. Let's this is bring not in. A solution. Let's bring in Michael. Um, can this ruling from the ICJ be enforced? Okay. So it's true that provisional measures are not always complied with by the states that have them uh, imposed upon them. Uh, and it's true that the ICJ can't send in uh, some kind of army to enforce its orders. Uh, but there's a, there's a high level of expectation that states will take their obligations seriously. And what I think will happen here is that, look, the situation that uh, in Myanmar, uh, the situation of, of the Rohingya has already received a lot of scrutiny has gained international attention in part because of the work that UN fact-finding bodies have done. The decision now by the court yesterday places even more scrutiny on Myanmar. And so uh, while there isn't enforceability in the sense that people might associate with a domestic court judgment, I think uh, the security forces, uh, the military will have to consider this extra level of attention that they are now under, that any act they take my, that, my could conceivably, <clears throat> that could conceivably could, could be construed as contributing to genocide uh, is going to be looked at in that light. Okay. And that will maybe make them think twice about certain actions that they otherwise would have taken. Will they comply in, in Myanmar? Well, oh, I mean, <clears throat> they will be under, they're already under enormous pressure to imply. I mean, if you look at um, a flurry of Myanmar government uh, you know, initiatives, Last week, starting the release of this so-called Independent Commission Inquiry report on Monday to Myanmar military holding a press conference saying that uh, they, they have a military justice system and that will be set in motion properly. All of these things would not have taken place without the prospect of ICJ carrying the case forward. The, see, like the first thing is that we need to understand the strategy, public relations, diplomatic, and political strategy of Myanmar government. When they admitted, the report admitted, war crimes, but no genocide. Exactly. That is a spin, because the Myanmar government knows the ICJ does not try criminal officials and leaders, only states. Okay, and, you uh, say you it's know, a spin. I just want to get the, yeah. the, the, the legal perspective. Michael, when we look at this and it says, uh, uh, in its recent report, uh, from the, the Independent Commission of Inquiry, there has been no genocide in Rakhine, but the commission found that war crimes had occurred. Would you agree with uh, Zadni that this is spin? Well, I, I'm not sure I'd use the word spin. Uh, it's an important concession in some ways, uh, but at the same time, uh, Zarni is correct, I think, in the sense that this is part of the legal strategy here 
to say that um, this is part of the government's overall narrative, which is that this is a counterterrorism operation, and that counterterrorism operation or counterinsurgency operation may have involved uh, soldiers getting out of hand, uh, running amok. I mean, that is part of their argument in terms of how they want to refute the charges of genocide, because the genocide is extremely difficult to prove. And part of the reason for that is that if you can point to other possible motivations that might lie behind mass atrocities, that can actually help to defeat the, the genocide allegation. So uh, while it's important in some ways that uh, the government agrees that human rights abuses have taken place, that war crimes have taken okay. place, uh, that can be used to the government's benefit in the specific context of trying to defend itself uh, in, in terms of the genocide allegations. Okay, Neil Ming, I've seen you shaking your head there with regards to the word war crimes. Yeah, because you know that, um, because I'm really shocked that the, the gentleman, the, uh, both gentlemen didn't mention about the, the how uh, the minority, the Hindu, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, group, more than 100 people got killed by the Rohingya or Asurs or you know the 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 uh, that also that they, they accuse that also. So they got a more than dead uh, more than hundred uh, more than hundred four or hundred eight dead bodies is already recovered. So, but uh, you know that I think the war crimes it's at the 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 level of war crime is at the how you defend it because you know uh, the in uh, two thousand seventeen there was a uh, thirty the police stations and plus one military base been attacked by the thousands of thousands of people. So then, you know, the, the, you're the human, you're human, human being, you're authority, you're, you're the, uh, so the, okay. uh, the security, uh, so you, you defend it. And then you're defend or people, how you die, how you suffer. So the, the, this is I th all. I think, I think you are blaming the victim here because you know, like, like uh, we are looking at not, what is essentially I, considered I, angry, I, I, desperate, poorly or barely judge, armed then, uh, 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 Rohingya Muslims who have born into this real oppression justice. and live and grew up there, no other choice for 30, 40 years, rising up Come on. out of a you situation no where they have no you future. You kill the people. No, 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 no. So, I mean, uh, you, don't have, uh, you don't have evidence that, uh, you know, a hundred uh, Hindus were we killed by the Rohingyas yeah, or been. other people. Okay. Actually, the person, the the, uh, the 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 lieutenant general who investigated yeah, yeah, the uh, he, this crime because was this my friend Aung Ye Win. He had wrong. no evidence but to produce when he was confronted by the Burmese uh, media and himself. So Zadni and Nian no, 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 you know, I, I want to talk. Points to okay. to argue that. I want to do something and look at the situation of the Rohingya now, both uh, in Rakhine State and in Bangladesh, around 700,000 uh, uh, in one both. Million, one million. Two, yeah. One million. Okay. Um, in Cox's Bazaar, what is their situation now? What rights do they have potentially as refugees, their conditions? Well, I mean, I, I, I went to uh, uh, the Cox Bazaar camps three times. Uh, two times as the guest of the uh, Bangladeshi government, uh, interviewed scores of women who survived the sexual violence or witnessed them, uh, saw children gunshot wounds. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, basically 300,000 young Rohingya, school age children of different ages, have absolutely no access to anything that we would call um, education or schooling meaningfully beyond uni self, like learning centers where. Uh, no real learning really takes place. And then also they face also the prospect of being caged in as Bangladesh begins to frame the Rohingyas as a threat to national security. And also that you talked about refugees. Yeah, Here's the thing that needs to be uh, publicized. Bangladesh is not a signatory to Roh uh, the, uh, the refugee conventions. Okay. Therefore, Bangladesh doesn't feel obligated to accord one million Rohingya refugees and this is important not to be status. forgotten. Yeah. No right. So yeah. okay, I, I, I want to ask uh, before we go. We've got around two minutes to go, uh, Neil Mi. What does this do to the reputation of Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar? Is she a hero now? Yeah, of course. Like I know, you know, uh, 
she got a tremendous support uh, by the the rest of the the Myanmar people because you know this is the the, the people of Myanmar thought that uh, we have been you know treated unfairly and bully and then a wrong accusation and trying to take a responsibility for that we did not make it. No, I think, I think that the whole like, victim... In 10 seconds, the reputation of Aung San Suu Kyi now. Well, Aung San Suu Kyi spoke, stokes, as I wrote in the Washington Post about 10 days ago, she, sto she continues to stoke Burmese nationalism. Every single perpetrator paradoxically see themselves as victims. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a fascinating debate. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.